I'm Jesse. Uh, this is my colleague, Sammy. And we are going to talk about interactive TLA+. So in my experience, there are two ways to understand a system. There's the precise way and the holistic way. And this is not a super well-developed philosophy. It's just something I've observed. On the precise side, we ask really well-defined questions like, does the system obey a particular invariant or property? And this is the whole point of TLA+. Plus. There are lots of powerful tools for this. But on the other side, the holistic side, we have much vaguer questions like, does the system generally conform to my uh, understanding of it or not? And holistic understanding of a system requires usually some interaction or visualization with it. And for TLA+, Plus, there are very few tools for this kind of thing, and they're mostly prototypes. Sammy and I are programmers, not mathematicians. And when programmers want to understand a system holistically, we do it through interaction. We give the program some kind of input, and we watch it run. And the way we observe it run is through debugging, or logging, or profiling. And we also visualize the execution with flame charts and call graphs. Compared to the well-developed ecosystem for code, TLA plus feels like math to us. We have to uh, think really hard, sit back and reason about our systems instead of uh, just giving it some input and watching it run and see what happens. Interaction and visualization are less well-developed for TLA plus than for code. So our proposal with this talk is to make TLA plus more like programming with more interaction and visualization. Our mission in this talk is to review the existing tools. It won't be a how-to. We're just surveying what exists and what's yet to be created. And we're going to propose ways to make TLA plus easier for programmers through interaction and visualization. You also have a mission. Your mission, when we have a discussion at the end of this talk, is to tell us what techniques and tools we overlooked and propose ways to make TLA plus easier for programmers. Spec authors have various questions that they ask about their specs. And we think that they ask different questions at different times in spec development, and that different tools uh, are better or worse for answering certain kinds of questions. Um, you don't have to read all of these. We're going to talk about each of them. This first question. It's the main purpose of model checking and proofs. It's the purpose of TLA+. Plus. It's super well uh, supported by production level tools. But as we go down, we get to vaguer questions like, is the spec generally behaving as intended? Or how do I use TLA+, Plus to communicate with other people? And these questions are less well supported by the existing tools. So let's talk about this second question. Why is my invariant or property false? It means that you have a wrong hypothesis about your spec. You wrote a spec with um, some behavior in mind, but what you actually wrote doesn't behave that way. And you want to figure out what is the mismatch between your theory of the system and what you actually specified. Specifying systems has a really good section on this, so I won't repeat what's in there, but I'll try to add a little bit. So when you're trying to answer this question, Error traces are the main tool, and you can read the text output. You can look at a trace in the toolbox or VS Code GUI. There's also this really nice tool by our colleague Siwon Zhou called TLA Trace Formatter. It makes a nice looking trace like this, and it's HTML, so you can publish it on the web. Um, if you want to use this, uh, it's a good way of talking about behaviors with your colleagues. And I think that integrating this with the GUIs so you had an export to HTML feature would be a really useful feature. On to the next question. What does this TLA plus expression mean? So you've got some expression, and you want to see how it's evaluated. The new TLC REPL, which was contributed by our colleague Will Schultz last year, this is really useful for answering this kind of question. You invoke it like this, 
and it gives you a prompt. Let's say that I'm exploring the bags module, so I want to see how this evaluates. It creates what you expect. Uh, the REPL imports bags and sequences and naturals in the standard modules uh, automatically for you. If I wanted to see what set to bag of one and two looks like, here's how it evaluates. It's a tuple. When I first saw that, it surprised me a little bit. Um, obviously, it makes sense when you think about it, but it felt like a discovery to me. And this is the big advantage of interactive systems is that you can find out things that you don't know you don't know by playing around with them. The REPL is still a prototype. It doesn't do syntax highlighting. I've just added some colors for the slides. I think that it can instantiate and extend other modules, but uh, it crashed when I tried it. So um, if this thing were fully developed and integrated with the GUIs, it would be super helpful for beginners, and I think anybody who writes TLA Plus could use it occasionally. So let's go on to the next question. This vague question, is the spec generally behaving as intended? If it were a program, I would put in print statements and give the program some inputs and watch it run. But in TLA Plus, print expressions are confusing in model checking mode. Let's look at an example spec now. This is the hour clock from specifying systems. It's just a 12 hour clock. The hour uh, goes up to 12 and then starts over at one. And I've added a print statement to watch the hour variable change. When I run this in model checking mode, I get this random looking output because the model checker is not executing states in order. It is uh, doing a multi-threaded breadth first search of the state space. If I want to look at one random behavior, I can do that by switching to simulation mode and set the number of traces to one. Oddly, I also have to set the number of threads to one. I think it would be really cool if the toolbox just had a button that said, show me a random behavior. Um, that would give me really quick feedback on how my spec is actually behaving. But once you've set it all up, then uh, you get what you want. The spec starts at some initial condition, and then it gives you consecutive states. So this is great for seeing how the spec actually behaves. Uh, if you want to narrow down the behaviors that you see, you can override the initial predicate. You can either handwrite it, or if you've got a trace in the GUI, then there's a feature where you can copy any state from the trace into the initial condition. Besides print statements, people often try out uh, graphing the state space with graph viz. We've uh, seen that um, in some of the talks already. So um, you can either do that with this invocation, or I think that there's also some checkboxes in the GUI for this. The default layout is often not very good. So um, I wanted the hour clock to make an hour-shaped layout, so I hand-tweaked the output. Is this graph viz output useful for answering the question, is the spec behaving as intended? Let's look at another example. I'm going to make a mistake, and then we'll see if graph viz helps me catch it. So I've got an extension here of the hour clock module where I've added an AM PM indicator. AM starts as true and then every 12 hours it flips. But I did it wrong. I say that AM prime equals not AM when the hour is 12. So that means that it's going to flip at 1 o'clock rather than at 12 o'clock. So that's my mistake. Can I catch this by looking at the visualization? Again, I've tweaked the output here to make it nice. TLC colors the nodes according to variable values. So the gray nodes are AM and the uh, white nodes are PM. If I zoom in on the transition here, maybe I'll see that this is wrong, that AM goes to false at 1 o'clock instead of at noon. Um, so it could be useful for this very simple spec. But for real-world specs, graph viz usually isn't the right tool. Um, this is a 
real world spec that I'm writing on MongoDB, it's only 11,000 states, it's not that big, but it's this very typical hairball, which all real specs look like. And even if you zoom into a corner, it's still illegible, and one of the labels is black on black. <laughs> I think that graph is, is useful for beginners who are learning the concept of a state space, but for real world specs, profiling is a much better way to see what's going on. So we're gonna do a new example here of an alarm clock, and I'm gonna make another mistake and try to catch it. So I've got a variation of the hour clock, and I've added an alarm hour, which is some arbitrary hour, and an alarm on indicator, which starts off false. When I advance the hour, I just add one. And when I set the alarm, I set the alarm to go off at some hour, but I forgot to set alarm on to true. So that means that the ring action is never enabled because alarm on is always false. Will profiling help me catch this mistake? Uh, yes. By default, action enablement profiling is on, and that means that I get a warning all over the GUI. Um, in the execution stats, in the source view. If I turn on detailed profiling, then the never enabled action is outlined in red. And there's also expressions here that are never evaluated, and those are also outlined. If you've got an expression in your state that's never, in your spec that's never evaluated, chances are that was a mistake. So this is great if you are using the GUI, but um, at MongoDB, we also run model checking in our continuous integration servers, so uh, we don't check in a spec that doesn't fail model checking, but um, it would be really nice here if TLC would fail model checking if there was an a action that's never enabled, or maybe also if there's an expression that's never evaluated. Um, you can't actually, I think, say in TLA+, plus all actions must be sometimes enabled because that's a hyper property of all behaviors and TLA plus doesn't do that. Um, so I think that this would be a nice feature for TLC that would make it more useful in CI. So if you've got an action that's never enabled, the natural next question is why is my action never enabled? And here we kind of struck out. Uh, Sammy and I interviewed a couple of experts and they said try staring really hard or thinking really hard. I think that coming up with a good tool for working specifiers to answer this question is an area of research. There is one uh, scenario of never enabled actions that I do have a technique for. Um, there's a specific situation um, where your action might not be enabled. So uh, here's the push and pop operators that Hillel showed earlier. Um, and in the initial condition, your stack just contains X, and then you've got uh, some action that pops from the stack and pushes to the stack. I think for a programmer, this is a natural thing to do. I have made this kind of mistake, and it took me a very long time to figure out what was going on, which is that that's a contradiction. It's saying that the stack is both empty and equal to Y. Um, therefore, the action is false and it's never enabled. Uh, I think that if you write this, you're probably making a mistake, and so I'd propose that TLC by default should just prohibit any contradictory use of primed variables. Uh, the larger question of debugging never enabled actions, though I'm not sure what the right answer is. So that's uh, the toolbox and TLC features. Let's look at a third-party tool. Uh, it's called ShyViz, and this is really great for figuring out holistically if your spec is behaving as intended. Uh, ShyViz is specialized for specs that are about multiple processes that communicate by exchanging messages with the vector clock. I think ShyViz is especially good if um, it's not for debugging TLA plus syntax errors, it's for debugging actual mistakes in your protocol design. So uh, it takes a little bit of setup, probably a couple of hours minimum, even if you're used to it. If you go to the ShyViz website, it comes preloaded with a trace from uh, a spec that Marcus made. 
and you have to give it a regular expression that tells it how to get the information that it needs out of the trace or log file or whatever. And Chavez doesn't understand TLA+, it only understands JSON, so you have to give it its vector clock in JSON format. But once all, you've got all that set up, then you get this nice space-time diagram, and it's interactive. You can click on messages and get more details about them. It's also got this interesting idea of motifs, which are common interactions among processes. I'm not sure what that's useful for. I think maybe for just, I think it's another way of holistically understanding how your spec behaves. So, Chavez is a, uh, a great way to understand your spec. Interacting it, uh, uh, integrating TLA plus with Chavez is not that easy. Here's what Marcus did for his spec. He used the new alias feature of TLA plus, which customizes the trace formatting. And he used the JSON module to output the vector clock in JSON, which is what uh, Chavez needs. There's a companion tool called TyViz, which is for multi-threaded specs. Uh, and I think that that's equally good for that style of specification. The next time I write a spec that's um, about the kinds of things that these tools are good for, I'll probably use it for uh, visualizing them. But it would be great if they were easier to integrate with TLA plus specs if either Chavez were taught to understand TLA plus output or uh, if there were um, some more built-in feature to TLA plus to integrate with Chavez. So, we're halfway through. Those are the first half of the questions, and I'm going to hand it over to Sammy for the second half. So, a lot of us are programmers here and would like to be able to make a small edit to a spec and then see how that changed the spec's behavior. Iterative development is a really common pattern for us, and it's something we can sort of do with TLA Plus right now by using the model checker, but we don't think it's good enough yet. So let's revisit the example of adding AM PM to the hour clock and see how we can find a recent bug we introduced to the spec that we already trusted. So we start with this hour clock spec that comes from specifying systems. Clearly, we're pretty confident in it. And we added this one line here about AM prime. Let's see how we can use the TLA plus debugger that Mark has created to find our bug here. So it's currently prototyped in VS Code, but there are potential extensions to integrate with the toolbox or some other IDE. Some things you can do with the debugger are you can set breakpoints and step through execution of an action. Uh, you can even step through nested expressions within an action. And I think this is one of the main advantages that the debugger allows us, because we can now suddenly understand what's happening within evaluation of an action, rather than just the transitions between the action. And most of the other existing tools are about traces, which kind of treat actions as an atomic thing. Some other things you can do in the debugger are you can see the state of variables, both primed and unprimed and you can see the trace that led to the current state. I want to note that the debugger is running, in, is running the model checker, which is doing a breadth first search of the state space. So this means between breakpoints, you don't really get continuity of traces. And this kind of means that we have to change how we interact with the debugger. It's going to be different from how we use a code debugger because of that. So let's jump into a specific example. So here we have, it's playing, okay, hour clock, and we set a breakpoint, and we changed, in the action we changed, and we run the debugger. So at this point, we want a trace when HR is 12, but we kind of have to keep stepping through until we find that trace. So there's a lot of effort that goes into it. And so let's jump ahead to once we actually find that trace. Eventually, once we do, we can step through and jump into the nested expressions we care about and see exactly when AM changes. And at this point, we might be able to notice our bug. Oh, we made a mistake. Actually, our line wasn't correct. Let's update it so that we actually change AM when hour is 11. So here we can see how the debugger could help us find a bug that we didn't know existed. So that kind of highlights some of the main 
the main advantages of the debugger, which is what's happening within an action. However, there are some limitations here because we needed to know which action to inspect. In a real world spec, you might have tens of actions. And so you're not able to set a breakpoint in every single one of them. And every single line that you edit, it's not really feasible to go through all these different traces and look at all the various state spaces to see how your changes like manifested in traces. So another limitation is kind of about those traces, which is you don't get those co the continuity. And so you don't know which traces are coming when. And this kind of makes it so that the debugger is useful really for really specific cases, but it's not quite there yet to help us improve iterative development. Now onto our final question. How do I use TLA plus to communicate behaviors to other people? We might write specs alone, but we are not building systems alone. So it's useful to be able to communicate a specific behavior to others, particularly those who weren't involved in writing the spec and may not know anything about TLA+. And this is particularly true if we find in model checking that some invariant was violated. And we want to discuss with somebody the behaviors there and maybe some modifications to our design, but we don't really want to get into the nitty gritty details of spec writing. So our colleague, Will Schultz, created an animation tool a couple, of years, a couple of years ago to help with this. And here's an example of it. I stole this example from Marcus's TLA Plus workshop from yesterday. And it kind of shows that you can use this to really communicate behaviors with people who don't have a lot of background with TLA Plus. So you can generate something like this with the SVG module that Will added to the TLA Plus community modules. And the way it works is that you would feed it a specific error trace and it would generate SVG for each state that the trace goes through. And then you can kind of stack those on top of each other and create such this animation. You can see how this might be really useful, but there are some limitations to a tool like this. And the first of which is that we can only visualize what we've modeled in the spec. If we've abstracted something away, then it's really difficult for us to visualize it. So for example, in message passing, if we don't keep track of which node sent the message, then we can't show it. So if two, node two is sending a message to node five, and we don't keep track that node two is sending it, how can we draw that arrow? Another limitation is that it currently uses absolute positioning, which means that we, there's a lot of fiddling involved in making the layout easy for somebody to understand and kind of something that you want to share with somebody else. So for now, this tool is good at what it does, but it's a, there's a little bit of overhead involved and it might not be for everybody yet. So at this point, we've done a brief, admittedly non-exhaustive survey of some existing tools. And what we've generally found is that well-defined tools already exist to address precise questions. So now, our vision for the future is that we build out more tools to help answer some holistic questions, like, is the spec behaving as intended? So let's dive into some specific ideas that we had that we think will be useful to build out in the future. And we hope that some of these will spark ideas for you to bring up in the discussion period of this talk. I talked before about how a lot of us might want to make use of iterative development and how it isn't quite feasible in the way we want it yet. So we think we should be focusing on building tools that allow for this better. So how can tools help catch your mistakes as you make them? And we think this means that hopefully we won't have as much to debug by the time the spec is fully written. One possible way to achieve this is to build out more features in the TLA plus debugger. And we think a key ability here is quick turnaround on making an edit and seeing, and seeing if that, how that changes behavior in our system. So for the debugger, this means being able to jump straight to traces that we care about and not having to spend so much time sifting through the uninteresting cases to us. And really, we just wanna see the effects of our changes right away without being distracted by everything we didn't edit. One way to do this would be by adding watch points to the debugger. In code, watch points allow us to break when the value of a variable changes. This has to be a little bit different for TLA+. So in TLA+, it would stop execution when a primed variable is assigned a different value than the unprimed counterpart. And in this case, we would set a watch point on am prime, 
and the debugger would pause when am prime changes to differ from am. This means that we would jump straight to this then condition with a trace, and so we should be able to find our bug just by inspecting the state of the state. In a real spec, this would also mean we would be able to set fewer breakpoints, because let's say we set am prime in four different actions. We don't need to set four different breakpoints for that, we can just set one and explore through the debugger. Another potential extension is conditional breakpoints. And what we mean is a breakpoint that only pauses if our supplied predicate is true. So here are some examples. We could pause when HR is 12, or if HR is in the set 11, 12, 1. And in this example, uh, if we set a conditional breakpoint when HR is 12, we can once again jump straight to that then expression where we set not am and find our bug immediately. Is there a weird echo going on? Okay, cool, sorry. So with these two ideas in mind, it means that we can make edits, jump straight to traces we care about, and inspect behavior that is important to us at the moment, rather than just looking around generally, so it can focus us a lot more. Now, another key element to being able to do iterative spec, to being able to do iterative spec development, is being able to experiment with expressions. We should be able to go from an idea to making an edit without having to spend too much time fiddling with parsing errors and having to rerun the model checker, etc. So the next idea is watch expressions. This is not the same as watch points, just wanted to point that out. What this is, is being able to evaluate expressions in the watch debugging section while the debugger is paused, and it's kind of like the TLC REPL, but with all the definitions from our spec already loaded in and with the current state of variables. So a common development pattern you, that we use for debugging code is that we've written something, we're trying out the debugger, we might not know what to write next, and so we start playing around with expressions and playing around with the current state of the variables. Being able to do this means that we can start editing our specs a lot faster, and we can quickly check if what we wanted to add to the spec next makes sense and generally looks reasonable. So a combination of these features means that we can change how we do spec writing. However, this still doesn't address any bugs in our spec that are in areas we never suspected to look into. Everything about the debugger is looking into areas that we want to investigate and that we suspect something is going wrong in. So there's this whole other element of understanding our spec behavior that we haven't touched yet. So this brings us to our next idea which is a graph of actions that enable other actions. And this is as opposed to a graph of the state space, which we already explored the limitations of earlier. This is more like a call graph, where we see the edge from HC any to advance hour, and what this means is that advance hour isn't enabled until HC any runs. Admittedly, we found out yesterday from the TLA Plus workshop that a tool like this does already exist, but it isn't very well documented yet. We still think this is a good idea and want to explore the potential use case for this feature. So let's jump back to our alarm example, where the ring action is never enabled. Jesse talked earlier about how we didn't really know how to figure out why an action wasn't enabled, and we think a graph like this could help. So obviously, this graph shows that ring isn't enabled, and that's kind of not new. The model checker already pointed that out to us. But the new thing here is that we can notice pretty quickly that there's a missing edge from set alarm to ring. And that's a natural thing for us to notice visually without having to suspect anything ahead of time. And so the graph really helps us narrow down where to look without having any sort of hunch. And so we think a graph like this will help us visualize the state space in a way that us programmers would find more useful. So, Leslie Lamport says, always be suspicious of success. And we definitely agree, but practically, how should we do that? One thing we realized as we looked through tools was that there isn't much out there for helping you figure out what you don't know you don't know. So for example, spec writers often rely on defining invariants and the model checker finding violations of those invariants. But that requires that any bug in your spec aligns with an invariant that you have defined. 
And for a lot of new spec writers, this probably isn't very realistic or very common, and maybe even for expert spec writers. And so we're wondering, can we build tools that will help provide additional sanity checks that we haven't got to check yet? So one such example would be something generated maybe by the profile, and it could tell us ranges that it encountered for each variable. So let's look at a kind of contrived example where such a feature might be useful. We have this tiny corner of a spec where we're looping x from 1 to 10. But we accidentally did it wrong, and now x can exceed 10. By running this profile or whatever this new tool would be and seeing the values that x took on, in this case, it might be something like from 1 to 100, we might be able to realize that something was wrong that none of the other tools could really help us figure out. And so we've realized there's something incorrect in our spec, and we can start looking closer. We might even be able to extend this for variables with some small set of discrete values. So could a new tool show us what percentage of the time variables had a specific value? So in this case, we have some variable x, which is a Boolean but we accidentally never set it to be not x. So the model checker or whatever new tool might indicate that the values of x is true 95% of the time. That's clearly showing us that something's wrong because for, most, for something like this where we intend to set it to not x, that would be a more even distribution. And right now, even adding like a type invariant wouldn't help us because x is in the set true or false, it's just in the wrong distribution. So this isn't the type of bug where other tools that we looked at would be able to help us, help us understand that something unexpected is happening. So there's clearly a gap in the tools right now to help us realize what we don't know we don't know. So now that we've talked through what exists and some ideas for the future, we want to turn this back on you, the audience. What are your thoughts on some of the ideas that we've brought up? What use cases did we miss? And what features and tools did we miss? And what do you think the right direction for making TLA Plus easier is? And before we jump to the discussion portion, I just wanted to quickly thank Marcus and Will for consulting on our talk and helping us flesh out some of these ideas. So this is one that a client just emailed me about like two days ago, which is the ability to interactively develop a spec instead of basically generating all the possible states starting from somewhere to start with an initial condition and then choose which action happens next and then see what an act actions that enables and then choose one of those going forward. So that I think is one of the things that I've heard a lot of people talk about and have also listed as a valuable thing and say at the Rodin platform that they really like and would like to see in the TLA plus tech, um, tooling. So that's one thing I think could be added to the list of valuable contributions. Which platform did you say had that? Rodin. Rodin. Rodin has it and Prism have it, have it the two ones that come to mind. Nice. Yeah, I can show you a demo afterwards if you want. Yeah, and I think we saw that a little bit with Afonso's talk, which I thought was also very cool to see. Like, that was a combination of the visualization and choosing where you want to go next, which was a great way to interactively explore with a trace. Yeah, one, one, one difference here is that um, that requires you to all already generate the entire state graph and then explore it. Well, one advantage uh, of being able to sort of do it as you're running is that you can do it on, say, infinite traces or ones where it would take a long time to generate the whole state graph. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, anyway, I've talked too long. Okay, I'm like 80% sure we're talking about the exact same thing, but I'll say it just in case. This is also the feature of Prism that I'm uh, most liked, which is when I was developing a spec, um, you can go into the debugging mode where you start on the initial state and you can like select which state you want to go to and choose your, kind of choose your own adventure through the state graph. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Okay, there we go. And that's two votes, that's two votes. That's in Prism also? Yeah, Prism, that's right. Yeah. I really want that now. Uh, minor remark, has either one of you looked at the TLA X bang pick successor operator? Pick successor. Because that prints on the command line the current state you're in, and then you can interactively pick the successor states, blacklist successor states, and so on. And then if you combine this with uh, the, the state graph printer, which has a snapshot feature so that it uh, prints the graph, reprints the graph after every state being generated, then you kind of get this interactive exploration of your state graph.
if that's useful. I mean, obviously, it's limited to super small state graphs, right? For everything bigger, doesn't really work. Although you can just pass in a property to pick successor, and if this property evaluates to true, it only stops and prints for the state, uh, prints for input. If that makes sense. So that's not fully fleshed out. It's just a prototype I built because I agree it would be nice to do this interactively. Um, and it kind of overlaps also with the, with the debugger. Um, but maybe this is something that people want, might want to pick up on and extend. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I really want that. If the question is, what's the right direction for making TLA plus easier? I got to say, I liked what I've seen in the Elm language. The, the error messages are a lot more, they're easier to understand. And that's been, I, I, when I play with TLA plus, and I confess, I'm not super sharp on it, but um, it's been kind of hard to figure out exactly what I'm doing wrong. You know, it, and it's like, I, and like I say, I suppose that's partially my own inexperience with the tool, but you know, but it doesn't help anything when you feel like, gosh, I just have no idea where, this, where I'm missing something on this, and the error messages don't really help a lot. So, whatever it's worth. Hi, thank you for all the great ideas. This is very um, thought provoking. Uh, I feel as though, maybe there's an overemphasis on writing specification and not enough thought about invariance and using invariance. I feel like these are two sides of the system. The specification without invariance and temporal properties is a mere machine. If you're writing a, an extension to the hour clock uh, module that uh, implements AMPM functionality, you kind of know where you want to go with that and what you expect it to do. You could find, you could potentially write an invariant or, or a temporal property that says like when, when we're transitioning from uh, 11 to 12, the AM state also changes, which would immediately highlight the problem, which is also a problem with toy examples that fit on a slide. Um, there are certainly real examples where it's much harder to figure out the invariant that targets the expected state that is bugged in your spec. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree. Um, and it, uh, Hillel was saying earlier to sort of check early and often everything you can think of. I think that matches your point. Yeah. I suspect he has a response as well. <laughs> Just to riff on that, what would be really, really interesting is the ability to generate a state graph and then come up with an invariant and see which states pass an invariant, which states fail it. So less being like, here's the invariant I need, does my design satisfy this invariant as much as here's my design, here's the states, how many of them satisfy this property and how many of them don't? That I think would be like really useful in that context you're talking about, especially if say you could tie it into say um, the graph visualization so you could just see which states do and which states don't laid out. Is that sort of what you're thinking? <laughs> no, that, that, that's a really interesting thought that, that um, you know, the, if the state space can be, you know, you've already computed the state space, why not make some use of it? You could probably really quickly check the states that meet some kind of a property, like is, you know, uh, is X always X, or is X always true, or is X always false, um, or, or do I expect like that the, the AMPM changes at a certain time, um, or changes a certain amount? Right. Um, or, or some other, you know, like uh, how, do, how many of my states include uh, a number that is even or out of range? Right. Um, last comment, and then I'll stop. Um, and then I'll stop being the comments guy. Um, have you ever tried taking the state dump and importing it into like a graph analysis software like Gephi? No, we haven't tried. Yeah, we right. Didn't. Yeah, that was that was something we were also considering. Um, yeah, there are tools for big graphs that are interactive and probably better than graph is. Yeah. I've done that a couple of times and it's interesting. I haven't like fully figured out how to make it like super useful yet, but it definitely seems like an avenue worth exploring. And now I will stop talking. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think we're over time with questions, but I see that it's leading to a super interesting discussion. I also have an 
kind of open-ended question in the chat. Um, but since it's my question, perhaps I should ask it. But I think I want to table it until after. Well, there's another one? Then please go ahead. All right, so quickly, um, thinking about checking only what changed, what do you think about comparing the set of behaviors, such as from one version of the spec to another, which behaviors were added and which ones were removed? Is there a way of doing this today? Nice. I don't know of a way to do that today that does sound useful. Yeah, I think some of the potential limitations there are if one of the behaviors you changed are like adding a new variable, then all of a sudden everything is different. And so the state spaces aren't really comparable. And so how do you reconcile that? Maybe it's useful for when you keep the set of variables the same and are trying to see like what modifications you made there. But there, I think there are certain things where you like add actions or add variables where it's suddenly very different. Okay, I think then we are through with uh, the questions. Then once again, let's thank our speakers, Sammy and Jesse. Thank you.